This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at Art of Dark Pod. Her final year at Iowa, she pretty much just worked. Like she got dead focused on trying to write this book. She had a little apartment. She lived in very simple, very simple uh, situation, uh, living mostly on vanilla wafers, supposedly. (laughs) Um, She did go on a few outings with this guy named uh, uh, Roby uh, McCauley. And then in 1947, she's introduced to Robert Lowell, the great American poet who would become a very useful friend later on. Uh, Flannery graduates. She spends another year at Iowa on a fellowship, and then she's off to Yaddo for the summer of 1948. Um, Now, Yaddo has come up previously on the pod in the David Foster Wallace episode. Um, What do we know about Yaddo? Well, it's an artist's artist's community, I think is the the term that they prefer um, in upstate New York. Founded by Fred Flintstone. (laughs) <laughs> that's right yeah 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 let me give you a little let me give you a little background on yaddo because it's actually pretty interesting so okay it's up in the 400 this 400 uh, acre estate uh i think it's near Saratoga, saratoga springs new york um how it started was that there was this guy spencer trask who bought the property in 1881 he was filthy rich from investing in edison uh and edison's electricity network he had at one point was uh had controlling interest in the new york times he was the president of the edison illuminating company uh which basically was the power company of new york uh he invested in the telephone the photograph phonograph all these things we're talking like money money right <laughs> like i i don't even know the numbers but one of these people like he would be a billionaire now right um he and his writer wife katrina trask had four children Um, all of whom died in childhood. And in an effort to give his wife something meaningful, they decided to turn most of this property over to the patronage of artists. And this got underway in 1926. Um, And let's read this. This is actually pretty impressive. Since the started, since Yaddo started, collectively, I'm reading just, this is just from Wikipedia, but it's interesting. Um, from Yaddo, collectively, artists who have worked at Yaddo have won 82 Pulitzer Prizes, 34 MacArthur Fellowships, 70 National Book Awards, 24 National Book Critics Circle Awards, 108 Rome Prizes, 49 Whiting Writers Awards, a Nobel Prize, at least one Man Booker Prize, and countless other honors. So you're in good company if you go to Yaddo. Um, you can <laughs> Fun. Yeah, we, we love stuff like that. I yeah. absolutely love stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to a, I'm going to a writer's conference in Valdez, Alaska. Uh, the the hitherto last frontier theater conference in June. Cool. It's now the Valdez Theater Conference. You can look it up. They have a Wikipedia thing. I get to in June. I get to fly to Anchorage and then get on a bus for seven hours. Oh yeah, to it's go, a, dude. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I have to tell you about Alaska though. Seven hours in a bus sounds like, oh, God, it's also going to be like the most beautiful drive you've ever been on in your life. <laughs> right. I will be looking out the window yeah. for most of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, have you ever cool. have you ever tried to get a Diado? Probably, huh? I have not. No, oh, no I should. don't even know what the process is. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. No, I kind of gave up on all those things for a while. But maybe you know, you got to slide down a dinosaur and. <laughs> Blow the whistle and yado dabba do. Right. I got is wear a blue tie and a leopard skin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, you can imagine the kinds of people that are coming through Yado. Uh Flannery at this point, she's now a part, though a minor part of this southern renaissance thing. And Yado was 
uh, Yaddo, though it's in New York, really did facilitate the Southern Renaissance to a pretty significant degree. Catherine Ann Porter, for people who know her, came through there. Eudora Welty. Uh, Truman Capote was there at the same time as Flannery O'Connor. Uh, Carson McCullers, who wrote that amazing novel, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. If people haven't read that. It's it's in my personal list of like must-read American literature, Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Um, uh, and it's a great setup for artists. I mean, Flannery O'Connor in her typical wry way would tell someone later, hey, the food is very good. Quote, the food is very good. The quarters are elegant. The servants, excuse me, the servants are very nice and the scenery is magnificent. So her calling something magnificent is really high praise. Um, also for Flannery, it didn't hurt that Poe had once written at least part of the Raven on the same property, though. That was before it was an artist's community. It just happened to be in the same area. Um, the place was run uh, by a woman named Mrs. Ames under fairly strict rules, except for chastity. They were they were cool. They would actually discourage you from bringing a spouse, which, uh, you know, is understandable if it's like, hey, you're coming up here to work on a book or whatever. But also it's like it's I, I think there was some interest in maybe mixing things up with people. Yeah. If you've never been to one of those things, uh, yeah, you can get a little gnarly. You, can, right. you, you start to see people peeling off after the first couple of days. Yeah. 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 Um, every day you'd, 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 uh, wake up and you'd be given a little boxed lunch by the, by the staff. Then you'd go off to your studio. There was a strict rule of silence from 9am to 4pm. Um, uh, and you know, so she, she got the right a lot and you know, what are, what is, what else is the writer's colony good for? In addition to writing like graduate school or something like that connections. Flannery gets recommended to the agent Elizabeth McKee, and now she has an agent. Let me read a little bit on this from the Brad Gooch biography. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, quote, in her introductory letter to McKee on, uh, sorry, in her introductory letter to McKee, Flannery apologized for writing to her, quote, in my vague and slack season and warned, quote, I'm a very slow worker. I've never had an agent, so I have no idea what your disposition might be toward my type of writer. Uh, evidently charmed by the candor and self-deprecation, McKee responded within a few days, quote, your work sounds very interesting. Please don't let it worry you that you are not a prolific writer, end quote. As they began to discuss the details of the contract for her novel with Reinhardt, Flannery, who reported that she was working on the 12th chapter, further defined her, quote, type of writer as decidedly not formulaic. Quote, I don't have my novel outlined and I have to write to discover what I am doing. Like the old lady, I don't know so well what I think until I see what I say. Then I have to say it over again. Um, okay. <clears throat> now, importantly, just as she's about to leave Yaddo, um, uh, and based on the help of some friends she made there, particularly the busybody uh, Edward Maisel, who is a Harvard grad musicologist, Flannery O'Connor is, is given an almost open-ended invite. So apparently, and I don't know how it works now, apparently the invitations were very kind of amorphous. You'd get invited if they didn't know you well, you'd get invited and you could stay for a couple of months. If they really liked you, they'd say, hey, stay as long as you need, right? And it was all dependent on how... Uh, this Mrs. Ames, how your relationship with this Mrs. Ames was ultimately. Um, so she was given this open-ended invite and she decides to trade her teaching appointment at Iowa that she had for another year at Yaddo. Um, and this was a big, this was a big move, right? This is the thing like, I'm going to give up a stable paying gig to focus on this book up at this writer's colony. Um, yeah. So kind of exciting, kind of exciting time period. Um, now, Apparently, most of the characters uh, at Yaddo kind of drift away at the end of the summer. As you're getting into fall and the winter, it, it, it gets down to a much smaller contingent of people. Um, and at this time, I, 1947, I think, yeah, um, Robert Lowell shows up and he begins to stir things up. Um, Robert Lowell... I, I, I struggled to figure out how much to talk about him because he's a fascinating figure and he's imp really important in Flannery O'Connor's life. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Um, but in terms of Yaddo at this time, Robert Lowell ends up at the heart of a major political divide that cuts right through the entire American literary scene. And this is based on the situation of Ed of Ezra Pound. Now, one day oh, we're going to do the oh, Ezra Pound. 
going to pound town yeah. going to pound town that guy that guy shows up <laughs> everywhere he does he's a big deal now i this is i i don't want to get i i th- i almost i wrote like two or three pages of notes on the ezra pound situation and i just decided that like that's a whole nother episode but let me just read you the wikipedia like paragraph about ezra pound because we need the context to understand what robert Lo- robert lowell's upset about what other people are mad at him about etc okay this is just so this is just from Wikipedia. It has the typical Wikipedia biases. Just know that we know that, and you also know that as a listener. Quote, angered by the carnage of World War I, Pound blamed the war on finance capitalism, which he called usury. He moved to Italy in 1924 and through the 1930s and 40s promoted an economic theory known as social credit. Wrote for publications owned by the British fascist Sir Oswald Mosley, embraced Mussolini's fascism and expressed support for a certain Austrian corporal. During World War II, Pound recorded hundreds of paid radio propaganda broadcasts for the Italian government, including including in German, German occupied Italy, in which he attacked the U.S. federal government. FDR, Great Britain, international finance, munitions makers, arm dealers, Jews, and others as abettors and prolongers of the war. He also praised both eugenics and Holocaust in Italy while urging American GIs to throw down their rifles and surrender. In 1945, Pound was captured by the Italian resistance and handed over to the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps, who held him pending extradition and prosecution based on an indictment for treason. He spent months in a U.S. military detention camp near Pisa, including three weeks in an outdoor steel cage. Sounds rough. Ruled mentally unfit to stand trial, Pound was incarcerated for over 12 years at St. Elizabeth's Psychiatric Hospital in Washington, D.C., whose doctors viewed Pound as a narcissist and a psychopath, but otherwise completely sane. A narcissist and a psychopath. Right. But, uh, but the I should call note, her. The... <laughs> right. But I love that. I love that note. They, they doctors viewed him as a narcissist and a psychopath, but otherwise completely sane. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 right. what, 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 sure. Okay. I mean, these okay. are doctors in Washington, D.C. I mean, they're at the heart of the Imperial Corps. Right. They, right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 If this guy so, was just a leftist, he'd, he'd be fun. They would have yeah. a job. They'd have, they'd have tenure. Right. Right. Um, okay. So let's now Robert Lowell is on the side of, of Ezra Pound. Um, and let me, uh, uh, and in, in here, yeah, well, anyway, let me let me read a little bit from from the bio on this. Um, uh, oh, sorry, wrong. Well, hold on. Sorry, I kind of lost my spot here. Um, OK, so uh, anyway, I, I was, there was a bit I was going to read. It's not worth reading. Robert Lowell is on the side of pound. Uh, this makes a lot of the people who are at Yaddo suspicious of him, and it becomes contentious. The, the this kind of winter skeleton crew at Yaddo kind of splits into two camps, the 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 anti pound, so thereby anti Robert Lowell camp and the the Robert Lowell camp, which happens to have Flannery O'Connor in it because her and Flannery, him and Flannery O'Connor are friends. Flannery doesn't really say anything ever, as far as I can tell, about Ezra Pound. I don't know if she even cared. I think she was friends with Robert Lowell, so she was on his side. <laughs> it's kind of one of those situations. Um and Fl- and Lowell loved Flannery. He dis- he found her quote acute. That's not cute. Acute. Found her acute and silent. And he did whatever he could to help her career, including putting her in touch with Carolyn Gordon, who taught creative writing at Columbia, and introducing her to Robert Fitzgerald, two people who'd be hugely important in Flannery O'Connor's career. Lowell and her became good friends. Um, and years later, Flannery would say quote He was one of the people I love, though. There wasn't really anything romantic. Flannery may have had romantic feelings for Robert Lowell, but it wasn't reciprocated, if that's the case. Um, one thing that that drew them together is the fact that at the time, Robert Lowell was in the process of converting to Catholicism. And uh, he so there was that angle and he was just gobsmacked by her talent. Um, OK, let me now let me read. Um. Let's see. Is this the part I want? Um, Yeah, here's a little bit of uh, Robert Lowell reminiscing. Quote, it seems such a short time ago that I met her at Yaddo, 23 or 24, always in a blue jean suit, working on the last chapters of Wise Blood, suffering from undiagnosed pains, a face formless at times then, very strong and young and right. 
She had already really mastered and found her themes and style, knew she wouldn't marry, would be Southern, shocking and disciplined. In a blunt, disdainful, yet somehow very unpretentious and modest way, I think she knew how good she was. So now, Robert Lowell being at Yaddo, bringing all this political baggage in, it it causes issues. Um, let me just read this. Um, quote, the spark finally set to all this Yaddo tinder was a front page story in the New York Times, um, a 1949 Tokyo war secret stolen by Soviet spy ring in 1941, including an accusation by General Douglas MacArthur. The article reported evidence from the army that Agnes Smedley had run a Soviet spy ring out of Shanghai, a friend of Mrs. Ames with a special dispensation of being a Yaddo guest from 1943 until 1948. Smedley was in the midst of writing a biography of um, uh, Marshal Zhu Dei, founder of the Chinese Re Red Army. Um, she idolized Mao Zedong, remembers Jim, Jim Shannon. Now, there's more to this. The point I'm kind of trying to make is that there was a strong leftist undercurrent to Yaddo, as we find and we would find in many artist colonies. Um, and... Robert Lowell kind of stirs that all up. And then at one point, um, at one point, I can't see, I don't see it now. At one point, the feds show up and they're asking questions about um, a number of things. And it's not clear. Some people think Robert Lowell told the federal government that there were communist sympathizers at Yaddo. Um, and so Ultimately, what ends up happening is that Robert Lowell leaves and everybody in the Robert Lowell camp at Yaddo at that time, including Flannery O'Connor, they all leave Yaddo too. So, um, so yeah, we're having a good time. Um, nothing changes. Yeah, something sounds just the, the very phrase writer's colony. Imagine the smell. <laughs> and you, you know it smell crazy in there it i mean it just it yeah. sounds like a good idea but it's also like it reminds me of that stanhope bit about you know i'll die for your sins like i'll hit my i'll hit my my foot with a shovel for your mortgage right like, right, like right why why do you need a colony for writers yeah like what yeah. is that and i understand it's career and it's a dating pool and you can relate to one another yeah. and you, you want sympathy and sure. uh, there's a lot of good reasons for it, but like what the, other, what other artistic profession, like, yeah. I mean, I guess it's a thing that's done, but you know, yeah, I don't know. To yeah. me at, at the age I've come to the biggest draw now is to have a time where I have very limited other responsibilities than writing. That's totally. I mean, I and if and if they're gonna, you know, do communal meals, and you know your Fine. meals are sorted, and you, you know, you don't have yeah. uh, children at your feet, and you're, yeah, it's true. There can be some benefit to that. I can right. see that. But it's yeah. also kind of a case of like you could do that yourself anyway. <laughs> like, why do you yeah. need this special? You know, yeah. it's yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now we we should start a podcasting colony. <laughs> no, please, God, don't. <laughs> <laughs> stop no nope. you're no nope. it's getting not gonna happen yeah no, not gonna not happen. happen sorry yeah sorry. not happening um now she gets out of yaddo wise blood as we kind of have mentioned well underway at this point not done she worked on this thing tirelessly right and it's interesting because it's a slim book and she works on it for somewhere between four and five years right but as you know, Kevin, you read it recently. I mean, it was 140 pages, something like that. Um, after she leaves Yaddo, she had planned to be at Yaddo for a while. She gave up this teaching position, right? So she's a little bit uncertain what to do. She ends up, she finds herself in New York City where Robert Lowell has gone, gone. And Robert Lowell's, I think he's engaged her at this time, the writer Elizabeth Hardwick. And she starts getting introduced to people in New York. Um, the Fitzgeralds, who I think I mentioned before, uh, Robert Fitzgerald was important. Ameri this is not F. Scott Fitzgerald, Robert Fitzgerald, uh, important American poet, critic and translator who rendered a fair amount of the Greek classics, actually, like you can still find his translations of Greek classics. Um, and later he taught at Harvard and elsewhere um, in New York at this time, the late 40s. She meets uh, Robert Guru, um, who is at was at at the time was at the publisher Harcourt Brace and eventually become a partner in a little firm called Farrar, Strauss and Guru. 
um, still to this day, one of the prominent uh, publishers of literary fiction. Um, she lives with the Fitzgeralds for a time, and she's sort of generally hanging out in New York. And meanwhile, Robert Lowell is getting weird. So let me read a little bit about that. Um, uh, as quote, as the first week in March and Lent progressed, so did Lowell's religious fervor and Flannery's special role in his vivid imaginings. He was to be a poet's con, uh, his was to be a poet's conversion more dramatic than even Merton's people who know Thomas Merton was a, was a, I, I don't know all the details there, but he was a devoutly religious man who was also a great poet, uh, on March 4th, he phoned Robert Fitzgerald to inform him uh, that on Ash Wednesday, March 2nd, his 32nd birthday, he had, quote, received the shock of the eternal word. And again, I, I said, I set this up by saying he was getting weird. This religious conversion stuff is not the weird part. This is coming towards the end of this passage I'm reading. He went on today, um, he went on, quote, today is the day of Flannery O'Connor, whose patron saint is St. Therese of Lisieux. At Lowell's direction, Fitzgerald got out a pad and pencil and took notes writing. Quote, he filled his bathtub with cold water and went in first on his hands and knees, then arching on his back and prayed thus to Therese of Lisieux in gasps. He went to the uh, Guild bookshop to get Flannery a book on St. Therese of Lisieux, but instead, before he knew it, bought a book on a Canadian girl who was many times stigmatized. Lowell then left town on a week-long meditative retreat for absolution and counsel at his own chosen Trappist monastery in Rhode Island. Word of these visions and of Lowell's insistence on canonizing Flannery began to circulate at Manhattan um, uh, cocktail parties. When Betty Hester, this was a woman who'd be Flannery's friend later in life, quote, heard such tales independently during the 60s and asked her friend about them, she obviously hit a tender topic. Flannery said, quote, let me right now correct, stash and obliterate this revolting story about Lowell introducing me as a saint. Apparently he was like going around telling everybody that Flannery O'Connor was a saint. <clears throat> um, at the time it was happening, poor Cal was about three steps from the asylum. He had the delusion that he had been called on some kind of mission of purification. And he was canonizing everybody that had anything to do with his situation then. I was very close to him, and so was Robert. Um, uh, that's Robert Fitzgerald. I was too inexperienced to know he was mad. I just thought that this was the way poets acted. Even Robert didn't know it, or at least didn't know how near collapse he was. In a couple of weeks, he was safely locked up. So Robert Lowell did go to the asylum after that for, for, a, oh, for a time. Um, dude, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a writer, I mean, that is a, uh, what do you call that? A uh, job hazard. That right. is a, uh, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, th this part about the, the receive the shock of the eternal word, he probably did receive the shock of the eternal world word it's just you know there's there's yeah yeah anyway. yeah i mean if you're if you're really truly visited by the holy spirit in this day and age yeah uh and it takes takes you over yeah you're it, and you're not it, already a priest or a religious and in some sort of a context for it you're gonna mm -hmm. appear to the guy at the strip mall like a madman yeah 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 and in yeah. some of this yeah yeah exactly yeah very well put very well put. This um, is exactly the thing I want for my own children. I don't want my children to fit in at yeah, all with this right. corporate hellscape. Well, there's a, there are, exactly, exactly. And Gotta, here's the thing, yeah. like, mm -hmm. here's the thing, Robert Lowell, one of the great poets, like Flannery O'Connor is one of the great writers. Robert Lowell is one of the great poets. Maybe that has to happen to you to make, right. to get a Robert Lowell. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. sure. I don't know. And now is a perfect time to talk about wise blood. Right. That Banger. A, Fun right. novel. Good yeah. film. It is a good film. It is a very good film. John, John, John Houston, right? Uh, John I Huston? I think it's I've... John Hunt. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's good. It's a good movie. Late 70s. Yeah, it is. Very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Pure Americana. So, yeah, for sure. You know the Coen brothers have watched that a few times. Yeah. 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 There's actually a good street. There's a good lineage between the Flannery and the Coen brothers, I think. Um, so Wise Blood, for people who haven't read, it's the story of this guy, Hazel Motes, a uh, young World War II veteran trying to find his place in the world, you know, one of those kinds of things. Um, and it's also about some of the characters he meets in the fictitious town of Talkingham, Georgia. Motes has a traveling preacher in his family, and we get the sense that he had a tumultuous relationship with faith, further complicated by the war. Let me read a little bit of this. Um, yeah. Wise Blood is... Uh, 
it's it's another on i mean this is part of the reason for covering flannery o'connor wise blood is in my like must read list not, not that anything wanna... is must read mm-hmm. but yeah. yeah but this is it, brad's must read list is a list of red flags for the ladies too we gotta because clearly <laughs> catcher in the rye is on there and we know flannery we know loved, that flannery loved catcher in the rye <laughs> And we know that's a huge red flag. Dude, dude, I saw a great tweet. You probably saw it too. I wish I could remember who it was, but I can't out the spot. Somebody said, I would hate Catcher in the Rye too if I was a big phony. If I was a phony. <laughs> uh, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one goes out to the fucking phonies. Uh, I will say, you know, one of the things that we do for our patrons on Patreon and Substack is we have a book club and we did wise blood for the book club. So if you can't yeah. get enough Flannery content, you can subscribe and go back and listen to that entire book club. Meaning there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, we're yeah. doing Hamlet next. So yeah, that's another fun thing you can do uh, as a, an art of darkness supporter. What do you got? Brad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just read this bit where it's in the early, it's early in wise blood. And I just, I love this whole passage where, where Flannery is introducing um, Hazel Motes, but in particular, I like this bit and I just wanted to read it. Quote, he was wounded and they remembered him long enough to take the shrapnel out of his chest. They said they took it out, but they never showed it to him and he felt it still in there, rusted and poisoning him. And then they sent him to another desert and forgot him again. He had all the time he could, he could want to study his soul in and assure himself that it was not there. I just love that. <laughs> like what a good, it sets up so many, uh, as, that's like a master class in setting up a character from in, from my perspective and my taste. Um, Hazel comes into this town talking ham and he's got a little bit of money and the first thing he does is he buys some new duds and he gets hooked up with this prostitute, Leora Watts. Shortly thereafter, excuse me, he meets other characters. Um, Enoch Emery, a manic, orphaned, and somewhat deranged young zookeeper. Uh, the Lily, uh, uh, Asa Hawks, the, the quote-unquote blind preacher, and his daughter, supposedly, uh, Lily Sa uh, Sabbath Lily. Um, Hazel becomes a kind of preacher in his own right out on the streets, particularly after movies let out. So he's like going up to, as people are letting out of a movie, and he's preaching the Church of Christ without Christ. And here are a couple of the tenets of this church. Um, let's see here. I mean, just a couple times where he's trying to explain it, uh, explain what it is. Well, quote, well, I preach the church without Christ. I'm member and preach and preacher to that church where the blind don't see and the lame don't walk and what's dead stays that way. Ask me about that church and I'll tell you it's the church that the blood of Jesus don't foul with redemption. He's a preacher, one of the women said. Let's go. Listen, you people, I'm going to talk the tr take the truth with me wherever I go, Hayes called. I'm going to preach it to whoever will listen at whatever place. I'm going to preach there was no fall because there was nothing to fall from and no redemption because there was no fall and no judgment because there wasn't the first two. Nothing matters that but, that, but that Jesus was a liar. That's one little bit. Let me read you another little bit on this. Um, quote. I preach there are all kinds of truth, your truth and somebody else's, but behind them all, there's only one truth, and that is that there's no truth, he called. No truth behind all truth is what I uh, what I and this church preach. Where you come from is gone, where you thought you were going to never was there, and where you are is no good unless you can get away from it. Where is there a place for you to be? No place. Nothing outside you can give you any place, he said. You needn't to look at the sky because it's not going to open up and show no place behind it. You needn't search for any hole in the ground to look through into somewhere else. You can't go neither forwards nor backwards into your daddy's time nor your children's if you have them. And yourself right now is all the place you've got. If there was any fall, look there. If there was any redemption, look there. And if you expect any judgment, look there. Because they all three will have to be in your time and your body. And where in your time and your body can they be? Where in your time and your body has Jesus redeemed you? He cried. Show me where because I don't see the place. If there was a place where Jesus had redeemed you, that would be the place for you to be. But which of you can find it? Uh, okay. <laughs> um. So that's this is this is Hazel Motes. This is the doctrine that he's preaching now. A, a very um, cursory glance at this. Somebody who weren't wasn't reading it in the full context or wasn't thinking about it might suggest that Flannery is trying to express some kind of. Though I, there's a way to read this if you're not paying enough attention that it's somehow anti anti Christian in a way. 
But the thrust of the Hazel Moat story, whereas many, many, we have many works of fiction in sort of modern times that are about um, people struggling to believe, Hazel Moats is struggling to not believe. He's trying to run away from as hard as he can. And part of the way he does this is by articulating these crazy, um, like quasi syllogistic things against the faith and it's because he wants it out of him and and it's it's sort of the inverse of a struggle with the typical struggle with faith that we're we're normally we're used to seeing right it's like sometimes you'll come across a story or whatever where the character's like you know god stopped talking to me and this is for hazel it's like god won't won't stop talking to him he can't get it out of him. He can't he can't sever that relationship, right? Um, let's see. Um, there's also a character in here. Um, yeah. Okay. So the basic plot, and I'll, I'm going to spoil it for a little bit here for people who haven't read it. So if you haven't read it, you just skip ahead a, mi- a couple of minutes. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this, but. Um, Hazel Motes ends up being driven into a religious fury, not by his own life, but by this guy, Asa Hawks, who purportedly blinded himself as an act of faith, but he didn't actually do it. He pretends that he did. And he has, in fact, he has a newspaper clipping about him doing it because he did intend to do it on stage in like a tent revival, if I'm not mistaken, but he didn't do it. And so now he lives as though he is the preacher who blinded himself. Right. And he sort of makes money on the street and that kind of thing doing this. And it drives Hazel Moats crazy, just the mere existence of this guy. So when Hazel spirals out, he ends up losing this car, his high rat-colored car. Um, He ends up committing a murder. And then he ends up, Hazel Moats does, in fact, blinding himself almost as like a moment, almost in contest with Asa, Asa Hawks, the not really blind preacher. Um, He also punishes himself physically. Um, um, Hazel Motes does puts rocks in his shoes and walks on him at one point he wraps barbed wire around his torso um, mortifications of the flesh um, there is a little bit I want to read on this because there's so many there's just so many good passages that uh, are just um, this is uh, after Hazel Motes has committed a murder and he has had a cop uh push his car off the road. (laughs) Um, Quote, after a while, Hayes got up and started walking back to town. It took him three hours to get inside the city again. He stopped at a supply store and bought a tin bucket and a sack of quicklime and went on to where he lived carrying these. When he reached the house, he stopped outside on the sidewalk and opened the sack of lime and poured the bucket half full of it. Then he went to a water spigot by the front steps and filled up the bu- the rest of the bucket with water and started up the steps. His landlady was sitting on the porch rocking a cat. What are you going to do with that, Mr. Motes? She asked. Blind myself, he said, and went on in the house. The landlady sat there for a while longer. She was not a woman who felt more violence in one word than in, an- than in another. She took every word at its face value, but all the faces were the sta- same. <laughs> Still, instead of blinding herself, if she had felt that bad, she would have killed herself, and she wondered why anybody would do, wouldn't do that. She would simply have to put put her head in an oven, or maybe have given herself too many painless sleeping pills, and that would have been that. Perhaps Mr. Motes was only being ugly, for what possible reason could a person have for wanting to destroy their sight? A woman like her, who was so clear-sighted, could never stand to be blind. If she had to be blind, she would rather be dead. It occurred to her suddenly that when she was dead, she would be blind, too. She stared in front of her intensely, facing this for the first time. She recalled the phrase eternal death that preachers used, but she cleared it out of her mind immediately with no more change of expression than the cat. She was not religious or morbid, for which every day she thanked her stars. She would credit a person who had that streak with anything, though. And Mr. Motes had it, or he wouldn't be a preacher. He might put limes in his eyes, and she wouldn't doubt it a bit, because they were all, if the truth was was only known, a little bit off in their heads. What possible reason could a sane person have for wanting to not enjoy himself anymore? She certainly couldn't say. Yeah, that is a stunning passage. It is. real. Yeah. The end of that book is rhapsodic. She arrives at this just incredible level of After he blinds himself and she's living with him, it's it's as good. Yeah. Yeah. It's as good as anything I've ever read personally. 
Um, yeah. Um, let's see. So now let me read you a little bit of a thing um, about en Enoch Emery, who is another character in this book who on this most recent read I had, I really, really res or really stuck out to me. Um, let me read you a, a little bit about um, this uh, about Enoch Emery from a book called The True Country, Themes and Fiction of Flannery O'Connor by a guy named uh, Carl Martin, I believe is his, the author's name. <laughs> Excuse me. Quote, Enoch Emery in Wiseblood is the most fully developed of the neo-pagans who fail to achieve an epiphany that indicates their acceptance of grace. Uh, since he functions in the novel as a foil for Hazel Motes, it is not surprising that in him too can be seen the characteristics of the existentialist. The most persistent feature of his portrait is the isolation, alienation, or separateness typical of the existentialist's explanation of man's condition. Enoch has been compelled by his father to move to Talkingham, where he works for the city as a, a park attendant. Though he professes to be proud of his job and, and to like the city, time after time he complains to Hazel Motes that he knows no one, and in one scene after another he attempts to ingratiate himself to waitresses, street hawkers, strangers on the street, uh, and finally with Gonga, a surly man in a gorilla suit who tells Enoch to go to hell as Enoch shakes his hand outside the movie theater. His isolation is aggravated further by his chaotic family background, right? So the reason I put that in there, just to give us uh, some of that sort of academic interpretation of this stuff, and also just kind of point out the the sorts of uh, what Flannery does with her characters in these stories. They all have a different, and it's not paint by numbers allegory, but they all have a different disposition towards like reality itself, right? We've got Hazel Motes who's going to go blind himself. We got the landlady who she doesn't seem to take anything too seriously, right? She takes words at their face value, but they all have the same face. And we got Enoch Emery who's going through some kind of insane religious crisis that's very difficult to even trace what it's even about. Um, yeah, but if, you know, Enoch Emery is, is like a Amer real American character you can yeah. meet right now. You yes. just have to go find the right neighborhood, the right place. He's out there right now doing the exact same mm -hmm. thing. He's a type. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's so that's kind of what's so powerful about it, right? Um, and so she she writes about these freaks. Right? It's kind of in a way, right? Uh, and so the question is, you know, why does she write about these? And I think it's interesting. Um, so now, not only does she write about these freaks, <clears throat> these people, these are these are well, Hazel is. I don't know what you would call Enoch. Uh, Asa, the 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 fake blind. Uh, Preacher is also Protestants, um, and why is she writing? Why is she why is she writing about them? In a way, is this just meant to uh, sort of demean them? Is it just writing about what are the consequences of Protestantism? I don't think any of it's. I don't think any of it's that clear cut. Um, one I think would be like a warning, like stray from the Kevin's one true faith. And this is how you I, end up. Right? It's not my one true faith. It's the <laughs> one true faith. But I mean, you know, it's, it's, it never feels mean spirited. I mean, no, she feels no. very generous about these characters. So I, it Agreed. may be satirical, but it's not, uh, cruel. Yeah. Right. No, I, I totally agree with that. I'm going to read a couple things from a, uh, essay she wrote called the, um, the Catholic novelist in the Protestant South. Quote, uh, it has been suggested, apparently with a straight face, that the biblical flavor of the South is a hindrance to the Catholic writer because Catholic readers are not accustomed to seeing religion biblically. It is true that if your readers are not well acquainted with the Bible, you don't have the instrument to plumb meaning, and specifically Christian meaning, that you would have if the biblical background conditioned everyone's response to life. Some of the writer's instruments have, unfortunately, to be shared with his reader. But the fact that Catholics are not accustomed to seeing religion biblically, biblically is a deficiency on the part of Catholics. And if the Catholic writer tries to accommodate himself to such deficiency, our literature will always be going downhill and ourselves be behind it. This is, after all, a, correct a correctable deficiency, not invincible ignorance. Nothing, I think, will in ensure the future of Catholic literature in this country so much as the biblical revival. Unfortunately, that revival is still the pursuit of the educated, and it is the good and it is the good which the poor and the ignorant hold in common that is most valuable to the fiction writer. When the poor poor hold sacred history in common, they have concrete ties to the universal and the holy, which allow the meaning of their every action to be heightened and seen under the aspect of eternity. 
To be great storytellers, we need something to measure ourselves against, and this is what we conspicuously lack in this age. Men judge themselves now by what they find themselves doing. The Catholic has the teachings of the church to serve him in this regard, but for the writings of fiction, something more is necessary. For the purposes of fiction, these guides have to exist in the form of stories, which affect our image and our judgment of ourselves. Abstractions, formulas, laws will not do here. We have to have stories. It takes a story to make a story. It takes a story of mythic dimensions, one which belongs to everybody, one in which everybody is able to recognize the hand of God and imagine its descent upon himself. In the Protestant South, the scriptures fill this role. The ancient Hebrew genius for making the absolute concrete has conditioned the Southerners' way of looking at things. That is one of the big reasons why the South is a storytelling uh, section at all. Our response to life is different if we have been taught only a definition of faith than it is if we have trembled with Abraham as he held the knife over Isaac. Both of these kinds of knowledge are necessary, but in the last four or five centuries, we in the church have overemphasized the abstract and consequently impoverished, uh, have, and have consequently impoverished our imagination and our capacity for prophetic insight. The circumstance of being a Southerner, of living in a non-Catholic but religiously inclined society, furnishes the Catholic novelist with some very fine anecdotes, antidotes to his worst own worst tendencies. Okay, um, let me read another little bit of this. I know that I know that was a kind of a long bit. Um, let's see, is this what I want? Uh, such an inter- such an inter- interesting idea that that Catholics are not Bible people, because of course the Bible is at the heart of Catholicism. Catholics wrote the Bible. It's just an odd. I know what they mean. We, we kind of understand what they mean, but it's like I don't know. It seems like the Bible's pretty important in the church. So I I know yeah. it's so. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 This is Flannery's take on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, I mean, you know, it's certainly not sola scriptura. That's not yeah. what the the Catholic Church is about. So I get right. that. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me read. Uh, yeah, let me read another little part. Um, this is about. Uh, this is about her writing about freaks. Because a, a lot of her characters are freaks in one way. Enoch Emery's a freak. Hazel Moats is a freak, right? Uh, and she loves them. It's it's not it's not um, demeaning of them. She she does care about them, but they're freaks. Quote: Whenever I am asked why Southern writers particularly have this penchant for writing about freaks, I say it is because we are still able to recognize one. To be able to recognize a freak, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception of man is still in the main the- theological. Of course, the South is changing so rapidly that almost anything you say about Southern belief can be denied in the next breath with equal propriety. But approaching the subject from the standpoint of the writer, I think it is safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. It is interesting that as belief in the divinity of Christ decreases, there seems to be a preoccupation with Christ figures in our fiction. What is pushed to the back of the mind makes its way forward somehow. Ghosts can be very fierce and instructive. They cast they cast strange shadows, particularly in our literature, for it is the business of the artist to reveal what haunts us. We in the South may be in the process of exorcising this ghost, which has given us our vision of perfection. Robert Penn Warren has said that in 20 years, there may be no such thing as Southern literature. By that time, the writer from the South may be writing about men in gray flannel suits and may have lost his ability to see that these gentlemen are even greater freaks than what we are writing about now. Um, I just I just love that. Um, OK, so <clears throat> moving on from from wise blood. Again, if you want to hear more about wise blood, get in the Patreon, go back and check out our our wise blood meeting that is recorded there. Um, we had a good conversation with with the crew. Um, now back into the biography of Flannery O'Connor. Um, we're in 1949. Wise Blood hasn't been published yet. She's having some publication issues. She had this deal in the works with Robert Garou of Harcourt Brace, but she'd won this award with Reinhardt, which is a much smaller publisher. And this is all kind of causing some issues. But ultimately, I mean, she's like 24 years old. She's got publishers fighting over her. Can't be all that bad. I mean, that's a good place to be in the career of a writer. Um, but she's not really sure how to handle it, right? December of 1949, excuse me, she goes home to Milledgeville um, from Connecticut where she was staying with the Fitzgeralds. And at this time, she didn't like going home. And you can kind of imagine why. She's 
from Milledgeville, Georgia. She goes up to Iowa, this big deal writer school. Everybody thinks she's she's you know she's brilliant. She ends up going to this fancy schmancy writers colony, right? Everybody there thinks she's brilliant. She's in New York, right? Like, not that she ever really left Georgia sort of spiritually, but she had she had broadened her horizons. And and at this time, twenty four, she didn't really want to go home, to be honest. Um, or that's the, that's the impression I get. But anyway, she goes to Milledgeville for Christmas. Um, and, uh, in Milledgeville over Christmas, she falls very, very ill. The condition was first described as a floating kidney. And then what was described as something called a uh, dietals crisis, which is uh, according what, what, what is a floating kidney? Apparently it's your kidney gets like in the dislodge. It gets in the wrong place. <laughs> it sounds like a, like an aqua teen hunger force character. <laughs> Doesn't it? Right. It's just like the floating kidney. It's like, yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's just like kind of slimes you a little bit. Oh, that would not be good, man. I don't like the sound of a floating kidney, man. The kidney's yeah. not supposed to float. Yeah. No. And she, she, she would jokingly talk about it in letters. She's like, oh, I got to go to the doctor and get my, uh, I got to get my kidney pinned up. <laughs> she always had these great little witticisms. <laughs> Oof. Um, but it was it, she then got diagnosed as something called the Adels crisis, which is this apparently a uh uh u- utero pelvic junction obstruction that causes abdominal pain. It's not even clear that she actually had this. It seems like they might have not been able to identify what was actually going on with her at the time. Um, whatever the case. It took her down quite a bit, and she doesn't get back to Connecticut for three months. And in the meantime, she's doing very little writing because she's in a lot of she's in a lot of pain. And but uh, nonetheless, she's still connected to these people up north. That May, she became the godmother of the third Fitzgerald um, child, all, uh, along with Robert Guru. So the name, and for people who are sort of in touch with the going, the the sort of, or who are kind of up to date with what's going on in publishing. Farrar, Strauss, and Guru is a big deal publisher, and uh, Flannery O'Connor and the Guru and and Farrar, Strauss, and Guru were the god were co godparents of uh, the 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 third Fitzgerald child, right? Um, yeah. So let's see now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me think about where I want to go with this. Now she so she'd found these sort of family of. Um, and this is a sort of disappointing time for her. She does try to go back up to Connecticut, but this is the beginning of a, of a kind of a downward slide in, in Flannery's health, um, starting in 1949. She was never super healthy, but this is where it's like, I don't know that she'd ever really been hospitalized up until this point for anything. Um, and so this is kind of the beginning of a, of, of, I don't want to say the end, but, uh, uh, sort of is in a way, um, uh, quote, and this is when she gets back up to Connecticut, quote, and she's still working on Wise Blood, by the way. Uh, the warmer months in Reading were highly productive for the novelist. During the spring, she invented such central episodes involving the radio preacher Hoover Schultz, a, shyster, a shyster's name much celebrated by the Fitzgeralds. In the summer, when she reached an impasse with the character of Hazel Motes, she found a startling solution by reading the copy um, Robert Fitzgerald had inscribed for her of his translation of Sophoc- uh, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Oedipus Rex. Ooh. Um, meditating on uh, Oedipus blinding himself in recognition of his sins, she dared to have Hayes sear his own pecan-colored eyes with quicklime, having closely read as well over the past year three women saints, Catherine of Siena, Catherine of Genoa, and Teresa of Avila. She uh, added some dark medieval touches, including Hayes liming his, lining his shoes with broken glass and wearing a shirt of barbed wire. Now reflecting physical pain and compunction, her novel was growing doubly deep and far more ambitious. She humorously complained to the Fitzgerald in December of heaviness in her, quote, typing arms. She had retyped her entire novel to set up Hayes' self-blinding and blamed the ache on her labor because she could no longer raise her arms to the typewriter. Okay. Thus begins this decline in her health. Thus begins Flannery shift from a sort of a northern, you know, she's she's starting to fall into this identity. She's a northern sophisticate, right? Living in Connecticut with these other writers. And she's starting to slide into <laughs> the life of a hermetic, somewhat physically dysfunctional southern woman living 
on a farm. And she documents, she talks about this in a story called The Enduring Chill, which I'm going to read a little bit from right now. This is one. Of, this is a, quite a good story. It's It's got a nice little twist to it that I'm not going to give away for people who haven't read um, The Enduring Chill. This is from uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find. No, actually, this is from, sorry, this is from Everything That Rises Must Converge, uh, that collection. Mm. Uh, quote, Ashbury's train stopped so that he could get off exactly where his mother was standing waiting to meet him. Her thin, spectacled face below him was bright with a wide smile that disappeared as she caught sight of him bracing himself behind the conductor. The smile vanished so suddenly, the shocked look that replaced it was so complete that he realized for the first time that he must look as ill as he was. The sky was a chill gray and a startling white gold sun, like some strange potentate from the east, was rising beyond the black woods that surrounded Timberboro. It cast a strange light over the single block of one-story brick and wooden shacks. Ashbury felt that he was about to witness a majestic transformation, that the flat of roofs might at any moment turn to the mounting turrets of some exotic temple for a god he didn't know. The illusion lasted only a moment before his attention was drawn back to his mother. She had given a little cry. She looked aghast. He was pleased that she would see she should she see death in his face at once. His mother, at the age of 60, was going to be introduced to reality, and he supposed that if the experience didn't kill her, it would assist her in the process of growing up. He stepped down and, and greeted her. You don't look very well, she said, and gave him a long clinical stare. I don't feel like talking, he said at once. I've had a bad trip. Okay. So anyway, it continues on like that. But this is about, this is another setup. The, 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 the mother who's the sort of parochial Southern lady representing Flannery's mother and the child, in this case, the, the male character Ashbury, who kind of stands in for Flannery, who's the sort of somewhat more sophisticated, but also thereby jaded and cynical character who, who's, you know, has spent time in the North, basically, um, right? She's constantly pitting these two kind of characters together. I think this happens in like a half a dozen of her stories. Um, okay. Now, after Uncle Bernard Klein passed away, Flannery's mother and Flannery inherited the 550-acre farm Andalusia. This was a former cotton plantation. It could do worse, right? Hey, hey. <laughs> Listen. I'd take it. Yeah. yeah, you're not saying uh, no to the family farm. That's a lot of acres. Oh, that's a lot of yeah. acres. Dude. And you ain't, you ain't no kind of man if you don't have land. <laughs> right. So they say. Yeah, that's so they say. You gotta um, have land. That's Acreage. Right. That's right. You gotta yeah. have a lot. A lot. <laughs> I had, I had a friend <laughs> cracked me up. I had a friend a, a few years ago bought a house and he, 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 he said, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but Starting to understand that whole only landowners can vote thing. <laughs> pretty reactionary. Yeah. I, yeah. Pretty reactionary. Yeah. 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 I, you know, listen, you I, know, I don't you, agree with it. But. In the account, right, right. You're yeah. just reporting. Yeah. These are right. your friends, the friends that you yeah. keep, Brad. Yeah. The, uh, you get winning hearts and minds here among the, uh, <laughs> the arts, the arts loving audience. <laughs> Those fucking are the darkness guys. Damn. <laughs> oof. Uh, oof. Oof. I uh, <laughs> listen. The year is 2024. Mm -hmm. The market is hot. If you if you can't get your hands on land, yeah. May I recommend any number of shit coins? <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried fake internet beans? <laughs> 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 because if you, I, I'm telling you, people, on uh, a long enough time horizon, yeah. the fake internet beads, you could probably turn them into actual physical land. I'm just saying. I, I mean, it's just as real as any other part of the economy, right? At this point, that's 100% what I mean. <laughs> Netflix is worth $350 billion right, for right. the direct it produces. Right. And right. all it does is entertain people. Yeah, and I, I fair to say that, uh, yeah, the <laughs> that the various dog coins and other internet, you know, yeah. beans entertain people. It, it, if and if you do happen to be able to harvest your magic internet beans, mm -hmm. consider buying some acres. 
<laughs> consider <laughs> buying <laughs> some actual property right. <laughs> that is tangible right. right that you can leave yeah. to your disturbed uh, progeny yeah. that you won't lose if your computer crashes yeah <laughs> right <laughs> right nobody's ever, nobody's ever said i lost my seed phrase for my land right exactly yeah exactly yeah this uh, is not a financial podcast no no um anyway andalusia former cotton plantation 14 buildings i think i said 550 it's 520 acres primarily used for beef and dairy cows flannery of course did not work this land um, she would at some point say about the farming that she, uh, she all the farming she did was, quote, from an armchair. Um, she always had these like funny little responses to everything, you know. Um, nonetheless, quite a landscape for a writer to live on. Right. Um, Flannery and her, it was pretty much just Flannery and her mother and an occasional relative, usually female, who needed a place to stay for a while. Um, she went through many treatments. Um, for this illness that she had, especially cortisone, which helped to keep the inflammation down. Yet she still suffered from pain and fevers. I don't think, I think it took them a while to figure out it was lupus, even though her dad had it. They should have kind of known, but um, she would have rashes sometimes. Her joints ached and you know flared up. Eventually she was treated with um, AC, ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone derived from the pituitary glands of pigs. Um, and she had this to say about the, about them because apparently this really helped. ACTH was like the only thing that really helped. She said, quote, if pigs wore garments, I wouldn't be worthy to kiss, kiss the hems of them. She's very grateful to the pigs for, for providing this. Um, it, and uh, sadly, apparently this treatment was so new that if her father had been able to have access to it, they hadn't figured this out ACTH yet in her father's time. He may have lived for several, several years longer and, but. Flannery was able to benefit from ACTH. Um, she did one time describe taking this medication in large, large doses and saying it makes you, quote, think day and night until I suppose the mind dies of exhaustion if you are not rescued. Um, so I kind of wonder if there's almost like a like a, a, like a, psych- a psychedelic or like a like, like a, a weird like a, mental like a nootropic or like an ADHD yeah. or something, right? Sure. Like I, I don't think it hurt the writing, to be honest. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, and it certainly did if, if it if it eased her pain even somewhat, then it certainly helped the writing, at least in that in that measure. Um, she lived there with her mother, which um, you know, <laughs> I just it, it, there's a lot of stories. If you're familiar with if you're familiar with Flannery Connor, O'Connor's work, and I had picked out some sections to read, I'm going to kind of skip over those for the sake of time. Um, but if you've ever read any Flannery O'Connor's work, just think every time there's a weirdly uptight, kind of judgmental, but on the surface very like um, uh, sort of warm to people, right? It follows all the social graces. But it's kind of hypocritical because there's this deep judgmental core. And we see this in uh, Good Man is Hard to Find, uh, in Revelation, in Enduring Chill, and a few other stories. That is pretty much Flannery's mother. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, okay. And the one I, one I would recommend uh, about on that, on that topic, everybody loves A Good Man is Hard to Find. I think that is a good story. I really like the story Revelation. Revelation and, and Revelation is probably well, we'll talk about it for a minute. It, it plays into one of Flannery O'Connor's, I think, most important themes. And the setup of Revelation is you've got this woman, Mrs. Turpin. She's at the doctor's office with her husband, and she's presenting herself as this very sweet um, woman, uh, very Christian woman who's worked hard for everything she's got. And there's uh, there's p- other people in the room in the the waiting room for this doctor's and so she's saying these sort of platitudinous things sort of um slyly complimenting herself even or at least uh saying how grateful she is for the amazing life she's been given meanwhile she's judging everybody around her judging people for being white trash and for being ugly and for children the child this child not paying attention uh, the the child not being well parented and all of these things and eventually <laughs> This girl who's sitting in the waiting room reading a book called Human Development. She's like a college student. She's very surly and ugly. She ends up throwing the book at Mrs. Turpin's face and saying, go back to hell, you warthog. 
And this whole thing makes Mrs. Turpin, it like breaks Mr. Mrs. Turpin's brain. Like she can't handle that insult. It's such a clash with the propriety that you're supposed to have that she cannot handle it. And it literally leads to like a kind of revelation. But I think it's the the sort of, you know, symbolic or whatever meaning of this is really interesting and tells us a lot about Flannery. The the ugly girl who throws the book at Mrs. Turpin, her name is Mary Grace. And one thing to keep in mind, I think, in all of Flannery O'Connor's work is Flannery's conception of what grace is. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, the notion of grace is like, oh, this kind of nice feeling that you can have, right? And for Flannery, grace which is something like a a moment of higher understanding or a moment of communion with God or a moment of of something like, you know, we'd call in today's terms something like spiritual growth. I think there's a lot of ways you could describe it. But for Flannery, sometimes that comes through a punch in the face. It's not always easy. It's hard sometimes. Um, and I think for Flannery, they often were hard, right? Her father dying when she was 15 in a way was a kind of a moment of grace. Um, the disease she had was she came to see as a kind of grace. So that's one of the things when you wonder like, why is this very religious woman writing? Some of these stories are kind of awful in a way. These awful things happen to people, right? It's because she's trying to remind you this, like that's not all fun and games. Like it, life is tough. It's difficult, right? Things happen and you have to reckon with them. Um, and yeah, so Revelation is a, is a, I think her best, the best manifestation of that theme in her work. So anyway, um, 1952, Wise Blood comes out. Flannery is 27 years old. Um, interestingly, just to place this in like literary history, it's the same year that Old Man in the Sea comes out. It's the same year that East of Steinbeck's East of Eden comes out. And it's the same year that the, uh, uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man Damn. wins the National Book Award. Damn, they're just they're dropping bangers, <laughs> right? It's like one right. of those one of those years in the in the nineties. There were certain years, I think, like ninety six, yeah. ninety two, where you just like it's just a killer's row of albums. Yeah. And you at yeah. the time, you're like, this is amazing. It's always going to be like this, and it right. won't. No, it isn't it's just the moment. Some for whatever reason that almost nobody can really explain. It just it, it all kind just of comes all together. happens at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy. Yeah. Nineteen nineteen ninety nine in movies is like that. If you go mm. back and look at like the best movie, like the the mainstream Hollywood movies of nineteen ninety nine, it's like how would they all? These were like in the same. These were in the theaters at the same time. It's incredible. Um, now, Wise Blood was not universally acclaimed when it came out. Uh huh. A blurb by her mentor, Carolyn Gordon, who related uh, O'Connor's work to Franz Kafka, probably didn't help because I think when people saw, oh, it's like Franz Kafka and they opened it, they were like, "Mm, well, maybe, maybe not so much like Franz Kafka, not entirely unlike Franz Kafka, but mm, not, yeah, you know, that's not, it's not the first name that comes up to me anyway. Um, Some reviewers called it wise blood monotonous which to me is an inexplicable criticism like i I can see not liking it i don't understand how it's monotonous. i mean if anything it's a little uneven which is the opposite of monotonous right exactly yeah Yeah, Yeah. exactly um a new york uh a new york a critic a critic from the new yorker who would later call her racist not the critic but the magazine wondered quote if the struggle to get from one sentence to the next is worthwhile Another reviewer, I don't know what magazine this was in, but another reviewer even said that Wise Blood was a work of insanity and that its writer was insane. That's actually a good review. Like, if you wrote something and it came out and somebody was like, this this book is insane and its writer is insane. That, to me, that that's rocks. good press. That that's rocks. great press. Yeah. yeah, you put that put that right on the, on the cover. <laughs> that goes in my Twitter bio. <laughs> For real, <laughs> my bet my uh, what is the what is the banner photo? Yeah, <laughs> uh, one star uh, in the Guardian. <laughs> yeah, one star. The writer is insane. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, the people of Milledgeville, where Flannery O'Connor lived, 
were even less understanding than the critics. Her first writer writing instructor from the Women's College apparently threw the book across the room, uh, and she had to write up an introduction to smooth the book over for her rich cousin, Katie Sims. <laughs> Imagine you had to write an intro like, uh, I'd rather she just didn't read this thing. Um, let me read a little bit about the reception in, at, back home from the biography. Um, <clears throat> quote, in Milledgeville, Aunt Mary Klein was equally horrified and theatrical. I can see her right now after the book came out, recalls the neighbor. Uh, drawing herself up, raising her head, crossing her arms and saying, I don't know where Mary Flannery met those people she wrote about, but it certainly was not in my house. <laughs> One relative remarked, quote, I wish you could have found some other way to portray your talents. Yet Flannery weathered the family drama as she encouraged uh, John Lynch, a writer and teacher at Notre Dame four years later, quote, I also had an 83 year old cousin who was fond of me and I was convinced and I was convinced that my novel was going to give her a stroke and that I was going to be pursued through life by the Furies. After she read it, I waited for a letter announcing her decline. But all I got was a curt note saying, quote, I do not like your book. Could you imagine? Could you imagine getting a one sentence note from a family member that just said, I do not like your book. Incredible. <laughs> Can you imagine writing that to your family member? <laughs> right. <laughs> not for me. Love you, not for me. I think you just ignore it's, it. Yeah. It yeah. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Hate the hate the sinner. Yeah. Uh, hate the sin. Yeah. Love the sinner. I think is what right. they say. Hate I the sin. You, love the sinner. I think if that happens, if that happens, just say I don't get. Or, the worst, yeah, just say, I sure. don't get it. It's yeah, right. Me. Well, but this is but this is our operating right. philosophy for everything online, Brad. Like, we can't yeah. imagine going at one star, right. me, right. fucking you, me, you know, right. this fucking right. thing. It's it's like, if you don't like something, move yeah. move, move right on. the fuck along. Right, 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 like, right, right. You know, yeah. like, that's, you, yeah. you talk about that. Yeah, it's really yeah. hard no, to imagine. Not, that is my, that yeah. is kind of my yeah. critical attitude. It's kind of mine, too. So like, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put shit on blast, like, privately, like, you know, yeah. in my own groups and things. But, yeah. like, I'm not going to, yeah. like, somebody's putting work in something. I'm not going to go out yeah. of my way yeah. to jab right. at them, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. My only exception to that is if it's propaganda. Right. If sure. It's, if it's art, sneaking, sneakily actually propaganda. Anyway. Um, I just thought it was fun. I do not like you. <laughs> I do not care for your labor of love. Right. <laughs> this thing that you are passionate about, you've devoted your life to, not nope. for me. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Try again. And there's, there's funny too, apparently like, because as Flannery gets like more reputation, she starts getting... Um, people would show up at Andalusia and, and people she knew, people from New York, whatever, right? Professors, visiting, you know, whatever. And um, there was, or one time her mother said, can you tell, I think this was to Robert Guru, the publisher. I think she said to him something like, can you try to convince Flannery to write something nice? <laughs> and then another time Flannery had another short story come out and her mother said, Flannery, does this one have symbolisms in it? <laughs> when I went and she went on to say, when I was coming up, stories didn't have symbolisms in them. <laughs> uh, wait until she know. wait until she uh, <laughs> learns what words are. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it didn't have symbolisms in them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um now there is something that goes on in this 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 period after wise blood comes out that's actually an important moment in in flannery o'connor's life and this is she buys some peacocks so she's got all this farmland and she's not a farmer obviously she's in bed but hey why not buy a bunch of birds right she buys chickens she buys swans she buys geese and then she buys some peacocks which she had never seen in person before and they show up in like a crate or something um and she she loved him. and 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 this is the thing they became like deeply meaningful to her and i think they were i think there were some symbolisms to it for her um i think there's something and maybe everybody has a different particular um signifier of this but for for but oh, flannery the impression i got was like it was it was like a little, the fact that a peacock's feather, it's spread, that amazing display that they do. 
I think for Flannery, that was like a little wink from God. That was just like a little like, yep, I'm up here. There's this is this little glint of just beauty for its own sake. It almost doesn't even make sense, right? It's, and it's mysterious in that regard. Like, why is this even a thing, right? And I think for Flannery, it was deeply meaningful just to be able to see that on a regular basis, right? And you have to imagine her. She's in her little room. She's she's frankly she's gradually dying. Right. And trying to reckon with that and then to be able to walk out into her yard and see that occasionally, I think, was something that, frankly, helped her sort of survive psychically. I think I um, knew about these peacocks. I think I had heard about these at some point. Yeah. Very interesting. Very eccentric. I like it. Yeah. 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 And she I, like her. I like her. Yeah. She said at one point, she said, I want to have so many peacocks that I can't go out of my house without running into one. <laughs> she didn't have quite that many, but she had a she had a few. Um, now I'm going to talk briefly about Flannery O'Connor's romantic life. Um, she never married, as we've said, she never had children. Um, as far as we know, she kept her chastity and never really succumbed to the temptations of the flesh. She, I'm sure had them, had temptations that is, um, uh, uh, now it's frequently suggested by biographers that she had romantic feelings for Robert Lowell. That may have actually been true. Um, and, but, you know, she had, she certainly, um, I think she confided to some other people that she had those kinds of feelings. And at some point she just kind of gave up on them. I mean, you have to think that this illness that she had degraded her appearance as well. And she was not necessarily, She's a fascinating person, a brilliant person, but she didn't necessarily possess, I think, the kinds of charms physically and personality wise that may have made her attractive to just the random pastor, random dude. Um, and the illness didn't help. Right. You know, eventually she's she's on crutches, you know, all the time, eventually. And none of none of these none of these things helped that that those matters now. She did get very close to having an actual boyfriend um, in the conventional sense. And this came in the form of a man named Eric uh, Lankjar, who is a tall, blonde Danish man of 26. I think she was about 28 or 29 when this started. Um, uh, Eric Lankjar was a textbook salesman for Harcourt Brace, um, which was Flannery's publisher. And uh, he'd been assigned to Flannery's region and he was in the in the area um when a teacher at the Georgia State College for Women thought Eric might enjoy meeting Flannery. And Eric was like, I don't, I sell textbooks. Like, I don't know why, I don't know why you want me to go meet this random woman who lives out on this farm, but okay, fine, I'll go do it. Um, <clears throat> and he goes to do it. And and um, they end up having a, a, a very strong relationship. Um, let me just read a little bit on this. Um, and uh, let's see here, um, quote, sophisticated, fun and widely read, fun, sorry, sophisticated, funny and widely read. Eric possessed a, co a cosmopolitan background rarely encountered in East Central Georgia. The son of a Danish diplomat and a lawyer and a Russian emig emigre mother. He had been born in Shanghai, where his father served as consul general. After a dif difficult childhood in Copenhagen, marked by bitter divorce proceedings between his parents, he eventually moved to New York with his mother. When he graduated from Princeton in 1948, he was then guided by his grandmother's cousin, Hel uh, Helene Iswalski, a Catholic intellectual and activist, to study and teach at Fordham. As a religious skeptic with a Lutheran background, though, Eric did not see much of a future in a Catholic college. One of his Jesuit professors, William Lynch, a, future the a favorite theologian of Flannery's, advised him to seek his fortune elsewhere. Feeling at loose ends, he turned to the publishing industry, and he ends up on Flannery's doorstep, sort of coincidentally. Uh, quote, Flannery was challenged by her facim uh, by her faci facsimile of a gentleman caller who had a strong Danish-British accent that marked him as a definite outsider. Although they talked theology, he wasn't Catholic. He was also highly opin opinionated and far from shy, from shy in voicing his opinions. Um, she later mentioned to somebody, strange people do show up around here. Um, now, this relationship kind of continues. Um uh, let's see, quote, 
Eric was stimulated enough by this remarkable new friendship to schedule regular vis visits to Milledgeville on weekends, often needing to rearrange his itinerary and travel 100 miles or more out of his way. As Regina made clear to Flannery that she considered his staying overnight improper, he rented a room in a local motel and then made his calls to Andalusia. Um, and then uh, there is, in fact, see if I can find it. Um, there is, in fact, a moment. And they, at one point, they start going out for drives together. Um, I don't know if I have the actual passage on that printed here or, or copied here. A drive is going, very romantic. Very romantic. It is very, very romantic. romantic. Yeah. Yeah. And at, at one point, um, at one point they did kiss Eric. I don't think I have that it noted. Eric kind of noted that um, she didn't seem to know how to kiss. Like she, she wasn't, she wasn't resisting it. She wasn't against it, but she just had never, you know, she didn't know the subtleties of it. And it, it's kind of a callback to her meeting with her Iowa professor where her Iowa professor was like Flannery. You know, there, there's yeah. there's a certain kind of way that people come together mm. physically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not gonna learn. You're not gonna learn how to kiss in your MFA, probably. No. <laughs> or no. maybe you are. Maybe, maybe you, you might. Will. You might learn how to kiss at Yato. <laughs> you might, yeah, exactly. It exactly. really is. The program is really gonna be what you make it. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you that. That's that's what I've learned. I'll tell you that yeah. much. Yeah. You can yeah. learn lots of things at Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, it's kind of sad because, you know, Kevin, I don't know how you feel when you're doing these episodes. You kind of go in and you have a certain perspective on these per people. And then as you go through, most of the time, I end up really caring about these people. Like, I care about Flannery by the time I'm into the 1950s part of her story. You just you care about her, right? Um, and you kind of want her to like, hey, if she wants to be in love and married, that would be great. Right. She meets this tall, blonde, Danish kind of sophisticated guy. And sure, they don't think the same exact religiously, but maybe they can make it work out. Right. But it doesn't. 1954, he decided that he had to return to his native Copenhagen. He was also too smart to be doing. He was a traveling book salesman and he was like he had gone to multiple universe. You know, he, he was he was sort of. He, he he was made for more than what he was doing in terms of his line of work. Um, they did have, uh, uh, and anyway, he goes back to Europe. He soon finds himself a lover. He was a little cagey in his letters to her about finding, finding this new woman. And she wrote some letters that, uh, Flannery wrote some letters to Eric that were kind of, they weren't love letters, but they were kind of coquettish. They were definitely like suggested that she had feelings for him. And when, you know, when she found out that he w got married, uh, apparently Flannery, she never said this to really to anybody, but apparently Flannery was devastated to find out that Eric was married. Um, so, yeah, um, there is a story, uh, Good Country People. It's one of these mother daughter stories. The daughter in this case is a woman, uh, I can't remember, I think her name she was given at birth is Joy. I can't remember, but she changed her name in the story. She changes her name to Helga to deliberately be like ugly, an ugly name. She has a wooden leg. She has a college degree. And one day a Bible salesman shows up and she's very attracted to him. And um, so that's inspired by the Eric uh, Lankajar saga so for people who've read good country people that's old it, 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 she takes liberties flannery does with the story and she takes it where she wants to but that's very much inspired by by her life um so let's see um we're actually kind of coming we're, we're getting there we're, we're getting we're getting close here um there's the next big work that comes out is going to be uh, the violent bear it away. But first, let's talk a little bit more about Flannery's sort of religious feelings, because this is such a big part of her life and her story. Um, she and and her illness kind of fits all in. The writing and the, and the faith and the illness are all together. Or, you know, they're all working. They're all feeding off of each other. Um, she... <clears throat> You know, her, her health continues dwindling throughout the 1950s, and she does eventually get diagnosed with lupus. Um, it, it 
uh, in 1955, she gets diagnosed with a quote unquote softening of the top of the leg bone. And the doctors tell her um, to walk on crutches for two years. And they think that taking that weight off will allow it to like heal. Um, and they also tell her that that doesn't have anything to do with the lupus. But it turns out that the later on medical science kind of figured out that the amount of um, corticosteroids she was taking to treat the lupus actually leads to can lead to this thing where it deteriorates bo certain parts of your bones. So basically, the medication she was the lupus was some, sort of under control, but the long term effects of the medication she was taking to treat the lupus were basically degrading her body. Um, and that's why you see her in the crutches. Um, uh, she's, uh, da, 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 da. um, here's something she said in a letter quote, I have never been anywhere, but sick in a sense, sickness is a place more instructive than a long trip to Europe. And it's a place where there's no company where nobody can follow success is almost as isolating and nothing points out vanity as well. Now, this is the thing, despite the fact that wise blood wasn't like a huge hit, she it was generally recognized that she was a serious writer to be contended with. And as the 50s wore on, she had a lot of opportunities to go speak at colleges. And uh, she was on television at one point. Um, she wrote some articles. She was, you know, very relatively well regarded. And she had short stories that were kind of coming out on a semi-regular basis. She also started writing book reviews for The Bulletin, which was the weekly or bi-weekly newspaper of the the catholic diocese of atlanta um so she wrote i think a dozen of these book reviews or something like that and she was reading a lot of theological material um in the after dark patreon.com slash art of dark pod also on substack at art of, art of dark pod we're going to talk about pierre tailhard de chardin um one of her major influences um and we're going to talk about you know his life and what he meant to her and how it worked into the, the final story and all of that. That's one thing we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about when Flannery went to the Pyrenees to try and heal her lupus. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, I think let's see. I think let's talk about, uh 1956 da, 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 da. let's talk about the violent bear away <laughs> now kevin you haven't read this one right no okay so the violent bear away it's kind of how i i opened the i it's how i opened this episode um let me read from uh georgia encyclopedia.org <clears throat> it's actually the best <clears throat> sort of it's the best kind of intro to the book i could find uh, quote, uh, O'Connor drew upon her interest in Christian theology and her rural environment for much of her fiction, including the violent bear away. The title of the novel is taken from Matthew eleven twelve. quote, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent bear it away. We're going to talk a little bit about that passage in a minute. The power of violence to affect spiritual awakening and the impact that a conversion of this kind has upon Christian salvation are important themes in The Violent Bear Away. To dramatize the abs these abstract spiritual principles, O'Connor chose to create a world of opposites in conflict. The backwoods prophet and patriarch of the novel, Old Tarwater, extends his reach beyond the grave and his influence over the lives of his great nephew, Francis Marion Tarwater, and his nephew, Raber. Raber, a school teacher, represents the view of the social scientist, believing that human behavior is shaped by forces of environment and psychology, that an aware human being is capable of changing and controlling. Young Tarwater, a teenager raised in rural isolation, is an extension of the personality and religious beliefs of old Tarwater. Excuse me. Young Tarwater is trenchant in his rejection of the ur urbane world and struggles internally with the facts of redemption as he has been taught to understand them by his grand great uncle. <clears throat> The novel focuses principally on young Tarwater's conflict with Raber. These two characters represent the contrast between a sacred and a secular worldview. In one world, spiritual salvation is possible, but freedom and individuality bend to God's will. In the other, self-actualization is possible, but the life of the spirit has lost significance. This conflict makes the violent bear away an existential novel in which the human condition is a modern, in a modern godless world is examined. Now that all sounds pretty much right to me. Um, 
I think one thing I want to kind of mention, uh, this is from, uh, I found the title very interesting. And, and frankly, I uh, admit my kind of ignorance here. I did look up the the passage of the Bible that it's taken from, and I sort of got it, but it didn't immediately make sense to me, even what that passage was saying. The violent, let's read it real quick again, and then we could talk about it a little bit more. Um, the, pass, the, the verse from the Bible is, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Okay, that kind of makes sense. And then the next part is, and the violent bear it away. Okay, but then why is the novel called that? It's it's not totally clear, okay? Um, here's from a essay called Suffering Violence in the Kingdom of Heaven by a guy named Carl E. Martin. Um, let's see, quote, The violent bear it away has acknowledged the gospel of Matthew as the source of its title, of course. Um, let me read down. I already kind of read that part. Quote, um, O'Connor wrote to her friend and frequent correspondent, uh, uh, Betty Hester, in 1959, saying this, quote, St. Thomas's glosses on this verse is that the violent uh, ones that Christ is here talking about represent those ascetics who strain against mere nature. St. Augustine concurs. Of this letter, uh, the, the professor Susan Strigley writes, quote, according to O'Connor, the understanding of violence that is expressed by Christ in the Gospels suggests a pattern of self-sacrifice that the followers of Christ are called to imitate. Uh, Richard Guione writes that although the passage seems to justify the use of violence in advancing the kingdom of heaven, quote, there is a counter meaning in the Matthean title that promises a dispensation after John the Baptist, namely with Jesus, when humility takes the kingdom. Building on Gione's reading, Gary, uh, Gary M. Cuba writes, especially when read out of context, the passage that provided O'Connor with her title and epigraph might seem to affirm a kingdom of sacred violence. However, the gospel verse actually undermines such a, vi undermines such a vi bloody realm. Given its complexity, establishing the context for Matthew seems crucial to understanding O'Connor's use of the passage, right? So there's been a lot of ink spilled about what does this passage not only mean, but what does Flannery O'Connor mean by using it? Here's another little bit. <clears throat> the concern of Jesus to redefine the meaning of the kingdom of heaven is made clear uh, in Matthew's gospel through the series of parables and teachings recorded in chapters 11 through 13 and in the section of Matthew between the visit of, of John's disciples and in the account of John's beheading that leads directly to the story of the feeding of 5,000 chapter 14. John has heard of the healing and teaching activities of Jesus and has sent his disciples to ask him, quote, are you expect, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? <clears throat> to their question, Jesus responds, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. <clears throat> this litany is familiar, is the familiar list of works of the prophesied uh, Messiah, with two notable exceptions, liberty to the captives and freedom for the imprisoned are not listed um, as they are in Isaiah 6.1. Now, uh, where's the other part that I wanted to, excuse me. Um, the verse employed by O'Connor for her epigraph and title appears after uh, the contrast between the greatest man ever born of woman and the least in the kingdom of heaven a fact that should alert us to attend to the least as they are present in O'Connor's narrative and encourage us to contemplate um, Tarwater's relationships with these people who are the least. This one character is named the Bishop, who is, or his name is Bishop Raber, and he is a mentally, defa uh, mentally challenged young boy. The central message of this section in Matthew in which O'Connor's epigraph appears concerns the values and structures of the mess messianic kingdom. So if we take O'Connor's choice of a text for her title and epigraph seriously and strive to place it in its original context, we are led to consider the parallels between the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, whom the Christian church traditionally has considered to be related, and Tarwater and his ecclesiastically named cousin Bishop. In addition, we are led to consider how the kingdom of heaven, a central image of Matthew, is characterized in the novel, a central element in the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist as Matthew presents it. Okay, I don't want to spend a ton of time dwelling on that. Kind of my point here is that what I wanted to express, not so much as to tell you what does this title mean, um, but to suggest some possible understandings of it and to indicate that Flannery O'Connor 
by the time the violent bared away, she was operating at a very sophisticated theological level. She was thinking about this stuff on sort of very deep intertextual levels and layers and multiple interpretations of any single verse was something she was comfortable with. Um, so yeah, I, I just, you know, and, it, and, but, but in the reading of it, you never feel like this is being hammered over your head. It's all in the, it's all in the touch. It's all in the edges of things, all in the setup. Um, and there's never a moment where it feels preachy, even when a character is literally preaching. It doesn't feel preachy, right? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one thing that I want to say about this too, and this is, this book is probably The Violent Barrett Away, is probably where her style reaches its peak. And I'm just so enamored with this book. There's not enough good things I can say about it. One thing I, I wanted to kind of point out, um, Flannery <clears throat> and this is something that marks her as an influence, I think, as big as Faulkner, as big as Robert Penn Warren, as big as any of the other Southern writers. And maybe uh, maybe some people will disagree with me. To me, Flannery O'Connor represents stylistically a bridge between the first capital, the, the first generation of sort of those capital M modernists, the Virginia Wolfs and the Faulkners and the um, Joyce's and uh, Hemingway's. She she marks a bridge between that and, for better or worse, what has come to be come to be the the realist MFA style. You know that there's there's a readers now will kind of mock or bemoan the fact that there's this like MFA style that has come to predominate. And sure, there's maybe a point to that, and any style gets worn out. But I do think that I do think you can see the seeds of that in Flannery O'Connor. And I'll tell you, like anybody who went through an MFA program for fiction uh, from sometime around 1965 on has probably read Flannery O'Connor in class. It's it's highly influential. And she does, I think, represent this bridge between a sort of a newer school school and an older school um, to kind of hammer this point home. Let me read a little bit from The Violent Barrett Away. So let's see here. Um, how are you doing, Kevin? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Okay. You were doing you were doing great. It is yeah. I, I lose track of time. I'm gonna get yeah. into like a fourth hour here. That's yeah. wonderful. I'm having a really good time. I was on mute there. Sometimes go oh, on yeah. mute. No, that's all right. I hope that's everybody's right. enjoying this. We love doing these core episodes. I know Brad's been preparing this for a while. I've been I yeah. peppered a put an image of Flannery and some kind of bird in the telegram chat. Okay. Go to, Excellent. Go to t.me <laughs> slash art of dark pod again t.me slash art of dark pod and if you want to impress everybody there jump into the chat ah. don't read the room at all just immediately yeah. start talking about your favorite <laughs> pens yeah. immediately begin talking yeah. about pens fine pens and, uh, and you'll be judged you'll either be you'll, judged yeah you'll be judged right and, severely hey, let the chips where the fall where they may that's what that's I think. right let, let the meme coins fall where they may <laughs> and uh read the rules and, and have a good time in the telegram t.me slash short of dark pod we have a lot of fun we've got a good group there truly really excited about being able to announce the second live show yeah, that we are cool. doing yeah. uh detroit october 26th 7 p.m yeah. halloween party uh, the death of Harry Houdini. Brad's going to mm -hmm. be on point for that. I know Brad's going to bring out his whole, all of his cousins will be there. Yeah. All of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Including the floating kidney. Yeah. Uh, floating kid boy, floating and kidney if you, will be there. And if yeah. you really want to win the Halloween party, you come as the floating kidney now. Ooh, yeah, that would yeah. be, that would be a huge win. That would and, be and, epic. and, you know, and it's a live show, but it's also like, you know, it's like a gathering of the juggalos, but, for Art of Darkness people. It's a party. Don't, we're going to hang don't, out. Don't, don't, don't tell the Detroiters it's a gathering of the juggles. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Sorry. Well, you know, okay. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not I'm trying just kidding. to be. I I'm mean, just giving I you mean a hard no, time. no disrespect. Yeah. I mean, no disrespect uh, whatsoever. No, really. I'm not from there. I know I would not want you. Don't come to Minnesota and start talking shit about Prince. I'll just right. say that. Right. Because <laughs> right. we're right. nice, but we'll get real gnarly. You start right. talking, right. talking right. shit right. about, uh, you know, the, the man, the formerly uh, artist formerly known as. Ah. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a Halloween party and we're going to do a live show and we're going to hang out. And I guess there's a bar and stuff too. So, you know, you'll there be able is. to hang yeah. out and yeah, we'll be able to probably, hang out afterwards. And, yeah, yeah. And there'll probably be like a super secret second location. We'll make sure, mm-hmm. you know, that Patreon and, and Substack get uh, early access or at least uh, a chance. We'll, we'll announce it there first when yeah. the tickets go on sale. And then, For sure. uh, yeah, just going to be a real fun time. Yeah, we're going to have a blast. We're going to have mm-hmm. a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me read. Cool. Let me read as we as we approach uh, uh, the final years of Flannery O'Connor. Let me read a little bit from the Violent Barrett away, and then I've got another Flannery theme I want to kind of talk about, and then we're going to talk about the last few years of her life. <clears throat> this is from the Violent Barrett away. Quote: "Jesus is the bread of life," the old man said. The boy, disconcerted, would look off in the distance over the dark blue tree line where the world stretched out, hidden and at its ease. In the darkest, most private part of his soul, hanging upside down like a sleeping bat, was the certain, undeniable knowledge that he was not hungry for the bread of life. Had the bush flamed for Moses, the sun stood still for Joshua, the lions turned aside before Daniel only to prophesy the the bread of life. Jesus? He felt a terrible disappointment in, in that conclusion. A dread that it was true. The old man said that as soon as he died, he would hasten to the banks of the Lake of Galilee to eat the loaves and fishes for the, that the Lord had multiplied. Forever? The horrified boy asked. Forever, the old man said. The boy sensed that this was the heart of the great uncle's madness, this hunger. And what he was secretly afraid of was that it might be passed down, might be hidden in the blood and might strike some day in him. And then he would be torn by the hunger like the old man, the bottom split out of his stomach so that nothing would heal or fill it but the bread of life. He tried, when possible, to pass over these thoughts, to keep his vision located on an even level, to see no more than what was in front of his face and to let his eyes stop at the surface of that. It was as if he were afraid that if he let his eyes rest for an instant longer than was needed to place something, a spade, a hoe, the mule's hindquarters before his plow, the red furrow under him, that the thing would suddenly stand before him, strange and terrifying, demanding that he name it and name it justly and be judged for the name he gave it. He did all he could to avoid this threatened intimacy of creation. When the Lord's call came, he wished it to be a voice from out of a clear and empty sky, the trumpet of the Lord God Almighty, untouched by any fleshly hand or breath. He expected to see wheels of fire in the eyes of unearthly beasts. He expected this to happen as soon as his great uncle died. He turned his mind off off this quickly and went to get the shovel. The school teacher is a living man, he thought as he went, but he'd better not come out here and try to get me off this property because I'll kill him. Go to him and be damned, his uncle had said. I'd saved you from him this far, and if you go to him this minute, the minute I'm in the ground, there's nothing I can do about it. The shovel lay against the side of the hen house. I'll never set my foot in the city again, the boy said to himself aloud. I'll never go to him. Him nor anybody else will ever get me off this place. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Here's a, here's a thing too. And this is kind of a grab bag of stuff that just by the, the book, violent, the violent bear away, make me think about. And I kind of just want to convey, but here's something that she wrote again. And maybe I should have talked about this earlier when we were talking about how Flannery uses Protestant characters, but it comes up here too. Um, quote, this is a, a letter quote and the fanatics. People make a judgment of fanaticism, but but by what they are themselves. To a lot of Protestants I know, monks and nuns are fanatics, none greater. And to a lot of monks and nuns I know, my Protestant prophets are fanatics. For my, my part, I think the only difference between them is that if you are a Catholic and have this intensity of belief, you join the convent and are heard no more. Whereas if you are a Protestant and have it, there is no convent for you to join and you go about the world getting into all sorts of trouble and drawing the wrath of people who don't believe anything much at all down on your head. This is one reason I can write about Protestant believers better than Catholic believers, because they express their belief in diverse kinds of dramatic action, which is obvious enough for me to catch. I can't write about anything subtle. That's another kind of one of her her reasons. Um, now, there is something else that I didn't really quite know where to fit this in, but I thought this was interesting, something that she said in a letter to somebody once. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about. She said, life, quote, life has, for all its horror, been found by God to be worth dying for. 
And I really think this is something that she kept with her, this notion. Like, because you have to imagine she's literally, she spends like a decade dying, right? Just slowly degrading, just slowly kind of sliding off the planet, right? And you got you to gotta reckon with that or, or else why not just walk into the river like Virginia Woolf did, right? You kind of know what's happening, right? It's, you know, you know why not? You, you got to, and it does actually interestingly make me think about, um, Kevin, I'm sure you came across the myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus. It kind yeah, of, of course. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Right. I have a degree in philosophy. I know. All right. Right. I know. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I, I mean, you know, I, I, you I, I, I don't know everything, but yeah. Right. I was literally right. in a, a play that Camus wrote. Yeah. Oh, which one? Which one's that? Cal Caligula. Oh, did he I was in a Caligula? production. Yeah, I was. I was in a production right. of uh, Caligula uh, okay. in two thousand and seven in okay. London. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of a lot of. Uh, I just thought. Yeah, I know everybody. Everybody. Jokes. Yeah, there's a lot of jokes <laughs> that people could. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of second looks. You know, you get your kid right. off. You get your. You guys get naked. Right. Right. You know? Right. 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 Yeah. So, no. No. Not, not really like that. No. No. Um. But I think of I, when I hear her say life has for all its horror been found by God to be worth dying for. It feels like the, um, it feels like the religious, um, you know, God believing version of almost like a compliment or a yin yang to what Camus says at the beginning of the myth of, myth of Sisyphus, where it's basically like, um, should you kill yourself? No, then life must be meaningful somehow. Like, Right. We don't necessarily know what that meaning is, but if you shouldn't, right. then it has to be, right? It sure. I mean, and then there's like just that. this pure will. I mean, the vast majority of life on the planet does not want to die and does not right. want to kill itself. So it must mean something. There's a will, right. a will to life. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And and Flannery, Flannery O'Connor is, is saying to me is something it's 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 in the neighborhood of that same kind of thought, but of course it's suffused with this deep, deep faith, right? Well, and that's um, fundamentally what, you know, Catholicism. But Catholicism is extraordinarily and notably, uh, I think the phrase is pro life. Right. All right. I mean, right. so you know, we right. don't have to get right. into it, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 I can see her wrestling with this in, in what little, uh, uh, you know, work of hers I've, I've read. And then now you're exposing me to. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think just kind of for the sake of time, we'll kind of move off the violent bear away. I, I would just tell you, I was, I, I really liked. I really love Wise Blood, as I think we've already expressed. The Violent Barrett Away, I, I I read it with my mouth kind of half open, most of it. Just like it's kind of stunned. It's it has these just these moments of you can't believe where it's going. And and you know, it also the plot, um, the plot feels more harrowing than than wise blood like kevin you kind of mentioned and i think i think you're on to something wise blood's a little bit uneven and, and it feels like it's kind of just like bouncing along until it gets to the end up until like the last third and then it feels like it really like dials it's in and it gets egoresque there. it's sort of yeah. episodic and yeah you can tell it was pieced together from different mm -hmm. stories to right. make a whole and yeah you know. right the violent the violent bared away it's just like it's just it just keeps getting turned up and turned up and turned up and turned up the entire time. And you kind of always know where it's going, but every time it actually gets there, you're, it, it, it's, it's intense. <laughs> I, I love, I love this book. Um, now back to her life. Um, oh, and there's, and, and also I should mention it has a great burial scene. It has a great fire scene. <laughs> It has a great uh, baptism scene. Um, it, You're doing yeah. your elemental thing, it, aren't you? It has it all. It's in Touches there. Touches on all the there. elements. What's and the it does air? It all so well. I don't know if there's really an air. I'd have to okay. think about that. Right. I think there is an air in there. Mm. I'm not sure. I got you. Brad has this theory where you know great art almost universally touches on all four of these primal element elementary mm -hmm. things yeah. in one way or yeah. another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I like it. I look for it. But, yeah. you know, on the one hand, it's kind of cute because it's like, well, yeah, the world is made up of those things. So, like, how do you get away with not talking sure. about them in a way, right? So, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's not the most brilliant. No, it's just it's world. just a way to think about art and a way to think, mm -hmm. you know, to, something to watch, to look for. I'm I'm with you. I dig it. Yeah. 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 Um. So, okay. So, 
Flannery's, we're talking about Flannery's years from kind of 1956 on now. At one point in this period, she gets uh, a pretty big fellowship from the Ford Foundation. It, was, it would be like $60,000 in today's money. So that's nice. Uh, she gets a lot of honorariums to go speak at schools. Um, uh, and her mother, her mother is actually turns out to be, it was interesting. Um, I, I listened to the, I watched this interview with, as I think I mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, Ethan Hawke and Maya Hawke um, talking to Bishop Barron about this, this movie. And, and Maya Hawke was kind of talking about the, 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 the environment that Flannery grew up in. And, you know, interestingly enough, Flannery is in a world of women and her mother, despite all these sort of like, you know, parochial mindset and all that, perhaps her mother's also like a powerhouse becomes like a powerhouse um, like businesswoman in terms of running this farm. She's given this 520 acres and she just like, it's just like doggedly uh, <laughs> goes after making it make more and more money, right? She's selling timber here. She's like, you know, shopping for cows to bring in to, to increase dairy production. She's very, very good at doing that. And she seems to like doing it. Um, so Flannery gets to kind of live off the largesse of that in a way, which which that's pretty good situation for for a writer. Um, now when the violent bear it away comes out, she gets coverage in the New York times. Uh, she gets, you know, kind of some praise, some praise for her quote, Blakey and vision. Um, but she also gets dismissed as a literary white witch, which she did not like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, even some of her friends didn't quite get it, including the poet, um, Elizabeth Bishop, uh, the writer, John Hawks thought that, um, much like Blake's criticism of John Milton, the writer John Hawks thought that Flannery O'Connor was perhaps tarrying to the devil more than she really thought she was. Um, but apparently William Faulkner liked it. So if William Faulkner likes it, everybody else can go pound sand, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> um, into the early 1960s, she's writing stories that will eventually comprise everything that rises must converge. Um, these include the stories of Revelation, which we mentioned before, um, uh, and Good Country People. Those are probably the two most most famous uh, uh, in there, Inclu uh, plus the, the actual title story, Everything That Rises Must Converge. And then on the Monday before Christmas of 1963, Flannery fainted. She remained in bed for 10 days and was so sick that she missed the high mass of Christmas. Interestingly, she was... Uh, kind of fading out as this new era was fading in. They just bought a record player and they had um they were just about to buy a TV, right? So she's like the things are things are changing out on old Andalusia. Um but she's she fell sick Christmas 1963. February of 1964, she's told by doctors that she had an enlarged fibroid tumor in her ovaries and she had to have a hysterectomy. Now, the problem well, you know, obviously there's multiple problems with that, but one problem is that uh, people with lupus, particularly at this time with the medications available, surgeries were very, very dangerous for them because they almost always caused a flare up, right? So you imagine you have this autoimmune disorder and then you, you inflict this really serious trauma on the body, everything just goes haywire, right? So she has this surgery and let me just read this bit from the bio. <clears throat> on this um so you know there's a question of like should she even have the surgery but you know and, and on the other hand she kind of has to get this thing out of her right uh quote admitted to baldwin county hospital on monday february 24th 1964 flannery spent the night before her operation correcting the galleys of revelation which had just come in the mail from the sewanee review so she's working on her stories in the hospital as she reread the pages in the hospital light the story suddenly quote didn't seem so hot for the operation the next day, the local surgeon, Dr. Walker, Walker, enlisted five blood donors and briefly considered an artificial kidney. Over the three days following, she was kept on glucose and cortisone drips. While she shared such surgical details with Marriott, it's just a friend of hers, everyone else was treated to a lighter version of events. Quote, one of my nurses was a dead ringer for Mrs. Turpin, her character from uh, Revelation. Uh... Quote, the outcome of this operation from which you returned home on March 5th was at first deemed positive. It was all a howling success from their point of view, she wrote Robert Fitzgerald, and one of them is going to write it up for a doctor magazine as you usually don't cut folks with lupus. 
Within two weeks, though, she was back in bed, quote, not doing any brain work except for reading, while subject to post-operative uh, infections and cystitis. Her physical reaction was dramatic enough that by the time of her 39th birthday on March 25th, she was no longer concealing her inkling that something was gravely wrong. Quote, I suspect that it has kicked up the lupus again, she wrote. Anyway, I am full of kidney pus and am and back on the steroids. In April, she was in the hospital for another 10 days. At this point, the lupus was running rampant with bad rashes. And her, uh, coincidentally, her Aunt Mary Klein, who also lived at, on the farm with her, was also in the hospital at the same time with a heart attack, just kind of an odd coincidence. Um, after this attack of lupus or this flare up, the pain was such that she couldn't sit at the typewriter. And she, so she mostly wrote in her mind. She would just sit there all day and think about story, her stories, right? All day long. Um, on a good day, she might be able to actually sit up and like write something for like an hour. That was on a good day. Um, and at the end of May in 1964, she was in the hospital again, this time in Atlanta for a lengthier stay in which uh, she wrote her story Judgment Day and um, I think finished up Parker's Back. We're not going to talk about Parker's Back, but Parker's Back is one of her like most intense short stories and one of her last ones that she finished quite good. Um, she got blood transfusions and was put on a low protein diet as her kidneys could no longer effectively process meat, eggs, and cheese. Something about her kidneys couldn't handle protein anymore. Um, she goes back to Andalusia in late June saying, quote, I look like a bullfrog, but I can work again. But as she also said, quote, the wolf, I'm afraid, is inside tearing up the place, right? Lupus, the wolf. By July, she knew she was dying and did little but rest for 22 hours a day so that she might get an hour or two of writing and correspondence. Now, let me read one little bit here <clears throat> from the biography, Brad Gooch biography. It's quite a good one if you're in the market for a Flannery O'Connor biography. Excuse me. The following Wednesday, Flannery was once again extremely ill. Her cousin Catherine called an ambulance early in the morning and she was rushed to the hospital. On Sunday, August 2nd, many of her close local friends received calls alerting them. Uh, quote, a friend, Mary Jo Thompson, has called to tell that Flannery is critically ill, remembered Louise Abbott. The end could come at any moment. My impulse is to drive over there, but I'm told she would not know me. Flannery received the Eucharist, and at some point during a very hot, very still Sunday, as her kidneys began to fail, was administered last rites by Abbot Augustine Moore of Conyers. Shortly before midnight, she slipped into a coma and was pronounced dead at the age of 39 on August 3rd at 1240 a.m. And that's the life of Flannery O'Connor. 39. 39 years old. Just bad Two, health. The bad health. Two American classic, not classic American novels, a number, you know, a dozen short stories. Um, and a name is as big as it gets in American letters, maybe one degree down, but, but, yeah. you know, from the very, very pinnacle. I mean, but, there's know, not, her, you know, what, Faulkner, another, Hemingway. Yeah. But yeah, right. give her another young. 20 years or sure. something, right? To really like, right. Yeah. Who knows what she could have done, right? I had no idea she died so young. That's tragic. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. Awful. Awful. <sighs> well, I feel like I know her better, which <laughs> is the goal of these, yes. these episodes, these core yes. episodes of Art of Darkness, a podcast about the dark side of creativity. Brad, good job. Thanks, I man. I really, yeah. And, and dark, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Muddy Waters, a Catholic mm -hmm. from the South writing, you know, about a lot of Protestants and eccentrics mm -hmm. and characters. Uh, yeah. Mad yeah. men and men and, 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 and creatures really, and mm -hmm. right. And, and really just suffering this, this, you know, the illness I knew about, but you, you start thinking about it and it's just like, Ugh. it comes on <sighs> when she's pretty young and it never, like once it's in the door, it never goes away. And it's you gotta like, just, yeah. And I'm older than she was when she died, man. And you start to I go, know. damn, I got, I'm, I'm got two feet, yeah. pair of hands. Yeah. I wear contact lenses. <laughs> like, I'm <laughs> right. doing okay. Right. I am right. Yeah. Doing we're doing pretty okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely a moment of, you know, 
makes you feel grateful for what you have for sure. And, you know, th- but the thing about Flannery is, is her, endu- her, her enduring faith. And even, you know, if you're listening to this and, you know, you're not a person of any kind of religious persuasion, I think the one thing you can kind of take from it is like, um, she's suffered a lot and she still managed to find a way to like make her life meaningful. Right. If you want to like, oh, yeah, zoom out a little bit just from, you know, specifically what she thought about this or that, like she still found a way to make her time here important. She didn't get despair. She didn't give up. She didn't, you know. Yeah. When we so. and we got to ask ask the closing question before you tease the the after dark for the patrons, mm-hmm. right? What yeah. is Flanner, Flannery O'Connor at the height of her power now, yeah. aside from collecting exotic, rare and exotic birds and mm-hmm. meeting various freaks in various right. Right. mid-sized right. southern towns? Uh, <laughs> what yeah. is she, what would she be doing now? You think she's the perennial novelist? She's writing a novel now about. I mean, yeah. yeah I think. I mean, I think. I think she ends up writing things that, and, and for some people she is this person, but I think she ends up being undeniably this person who is Melville, Twain, uh, Hemingway, If Faulkner. she continues, if she has yes. more years to write, you she, think that she mm, undeniably arrives at the very pinnacle I, of American I th- letters. I, th- I think that's her, the trajectory yeah, she's headed towards for sure. Yeah. And so, and she, she was never going to stop writing. She might've had a mm. year here that wasn't as productive as the last, but she was never going to stop. She, she was uh, literally, I mean, she gets to a point that that great bit in the blues brothers movie where they ask what you're doing and they say, we're on a mission from God. That's Flannery O'Connor. She's on a mission from God. There's nothing's going to get, you got to kill her to get her to stop. After dark, what are we, what are we doing there for patrons? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, Flannery O'Connor got very into, very serious about theology, like reading theological um, di- books and, and track, track, uh, tracts and, and various things in her later years. And, you know, one thing she thought was, and this wasn't a um, criticism of, of the Catholic Church or anything like that, but she she thought that the 20th century needed a sort of a rejuvenation of its theological stance. It needed like a new thinker to come along and try to f- what, what's going on in the 20th century, right? With without any you know, again, nothing heretical, but just all these things constantly need to be thought and examined and placed in their context. And she thought she found that person in Pierre Teilhard de Chardin who is a, a towering figure, um, not just in you know, Catholicism, but broadly. So we're going to talk about his life a little bit and what his ideas were and what they meant to, you know, how that translated into Flannery's work. And then we're also going to talk about the time Flannery and her mother took a trip to Lourdes in the French Pyrenees to see if they could heal what uh, they could heal Flannery's lupus. Amazing. Yeah. And that will be for patrons, patreon.com slash art of dark pod, substack.com slash at art of dark pod. We are at art of dark pod.com. If you want to go there, YouTube, if you want to want to see our faces, uh, it's, it's all right. If you don't, yeah. Yeah, and don't Spotify <laughs> and iTunes and all the usual pay, uh, places, we'll be back in a few minutes for the after dark, Brad. Another banger. Thank you. Thanks, man. You really, Thank you. you really sold her. Yeah. I, I hope people go and read her. And I Thank am, I, and I encourage everybody right now to go and hydrate uh, because we don't want any, any floating kidneys among our listeners. I don't know if right. the one just stay, stay hydrated. Yeah. Okay? I'm not even sure your kidney can float, but it wouldn't be good if it wouldn't be good if it did. I don't know if kidneys stop floating at some point. I have no idea. The other thing, of course, is like <laughs> just listen. If you are one of these eccentric characters that she would have been writing about, yeah. I want to tell you something, heart to heart. I don't care if you're a Protestant, a Catholic, Muslim. I don't care what you are. God bless you. You keep doing you. This is a podcast for the freaks. It is. By the, by the freaks, for the freaks. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen.